Yeah, no, we go back a long way to 1975 when uh, the first Roxy tour of uh, Australia and I met him and the rest of the guys at the uh, Horden Pavilion when in they Sydney. were the support act for us in Sydney, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, The Ghost of Santiago, you know, this is the second album uh, of a batch of songs that we started when lockdown happened, really. <clears throat> Tim sent me uh, an email from Auckland where he's living and, and said, you know, have you got any beats or any Latin grooves, especially slow Latin grooves. He was in that kind of strange mood. <clears throat> so I said, sure, you've come to the right place. <laughs> I started sending him stuff. And then when I ran out of Latin stuff, I just looked in my computer and just found anything that, that I had lying around. <clears throat> and I would send it to him and he would literally send it back within 24 hours with um, with singing on it. And with words sometimes, and I just thought, this is impossible. How is he doing it? He's like, who did, you know, magician. <laughs> um, and he must have been storing up stuff or whatever, must have a book somewhere full of lyrics and his works on all the time. <clears throat> and it was just extraordinary. I mean, you know, I have worked this way all my life, really, because <clears throat> with Roxy, it was always do the music first, and then Brian would try and write a top line to it uh, and, uh, and some words. And I don't think Tim was really used to that. He's a proper songwriter <clears throat> where he will sit with a guitar or a piano and hum a melody and then craft it up, just like you, you see Paul McCartney doing in, <laughs> in the Beatles docker. You know, it's, that's a you know, unique kind of person. But I, I was never like that, and Roxy were never like that. <clears throat> so. I think he quite enjoyed this new challenge, which was, I'd send him some music and I'd say, you know, if you want to change anything or add anything, or some, just do it. And he'd say, no, I want to just write to whatever you send me as a sort of <laughs> discipline. An exercise, very, yeah. Yeah, very different, <clears throat> interesting process. But, you know, all the music uh, that out of the 25 tracks that we ended up um, writing, uh, com virtually completely different and uh, but what unifies it all is Tim's wonderful voice and his you know storytelling that he gets into and you know the Ghost of Santiago the actual track is a classic sort of Tim profane sort of story <laughs> about a priest who's trying to you know elope with a nun who falls in love with a nun and tries to elope with her but she doesn't turn up at the meeting place, you know, and it's set in Santiago. I mean, he, in his mind, he was setting it in Santiago de Chile. Yeah. And in my mind, I was setting it in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Right. But Santiago, Chile's always been somewhere you've wanted to get and haven't been to yet, have you? Well, no, actually, Santiago, uh, Tim has never been there, but I have been there. Yeah, I... I played there with David Gilmore when I was oh, really? uh, on tour with David Gilmore. We played in a big stadium and it was fantastic. And uh, the, the, you know, the punters, the guys and girls, they're just such a great audience. They just yeah. love, South Americans love rock music. I mean, you know, Argentina and places like that, they just love heavy metal. It's totally bizarre. And they love Pink Floyd and they love all that kind of stuff. You know, I was brought up in South America, so I'm expecting everyone to just love salsa or cumbia or tango. <laughs> and that's they, not the case. Now, I was going to say, you, you've always had a bit of a passion for Latin grooves, haven't you? Yeah, well, because that's, you know, that's how I started. You know, I, uh, in Cuba, uh, with my mum teaching me, my mum was Colombian from Barranquilla in Colombia. <clears throat> my father was British. But she started having guitar lessons when I was about six. Wow. And to get rid of this annoying little brat that was me, she said, look, I'm just going to have to teach you to play something because otherwise it's going to drive me mad. It's all this plucking the strings and things. So <laughs> that's why I started with, um, you know, Latin American songs and things like that. So it's way before rock and roll for me. Right, right, right. And yeah, of but, course... Um, 
Yeah. You, you, you founded your first band in about 1966, is that right? <laughs> well, hardly, you know, a school band. You know, when you're at school, you know, you wanna uh, get together with your chums and make music, you know, and, you know, I begged my parents to send me to England when I was nine, you know, from, from Venezuela, because I wanted, A, I wanted to, you know, I was virtually an only child because my brother and sister lived in, uh, well, they went to boarding school in England. And I, so I, I wanted to be with other people, you know, with other kids, siblings and things, yeah. you know, so I said, send me to boarding school in England. I, and also the music is incredible. So I arrived, can you imagine, I arrived in September 1960, the beginning of the 60s in England, and all the music that came out just drove me wild. You know, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Hendrix. So at school, we all wanted to be like, all school, but wanted to be like our heroes. Let's form a band, you know. Surely you can learn to play two chords, you know. Is that all it took? It, well, yeah, it was pretty pathetic what we used to play, <laughs> but, you know, but, but you we tried. You were cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we were cool. And then gradually, as I got older, the musicians I found at the school were great, actually. And, and I mean, one of them has ended up being Peter Gabriel's guitarist for the last 40 years. And, and the, the, one of my schoolmates, the other guy was, um, is a famous avant-garde drummer now, Charles Hayward, and then Bill McCormick played with Robert Wyatt and with me in the 801 band on bass. So those schoolboy chums turned out to be actually- Lifelong Sarin, musical chums. Yeah, seren serendipitous, but you know, you know, you meeting Tim and, and Neil when he was quite young, when they sent him to England in 1975 to join Split Ends, you know, it's great. It's like having more chums, you know. And uh, so, you know, here I am still. Um, I mean, David Gilmore, I've known since I was 16. He lives next door. You know, I'm, I speak with Tim all the time. I saw Neil play at Hampton Court Palace a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is just the same chums, if you like. <laughs> it's very nice, you know, just to have friends who you like, who happen to be great musicians. You yeah, can I can imagine. And, and that you get to work with also, it's awesome. Yeah, you get to work with them. So, um, but you know, we, we, me and Tim, we, I just sent stuff and backwards and forwards. <clears throat> and really for the first 18 months, we didn't even think of, uh, you know, something like Zoom, because we had no idea how to do Zoom. But then, you know, obviously all our children taught us how to do Zoom. <laughs> Funny and then we about thought, that. Crikey, I haven't actually seen you. We've been doing all this music, I haven't actually seen you <laughs> at all. So then we went on Zoom and had like long chats, which I filmed actually, which are up on my... Um, I saw those, yeah. Yeah, the, just talking about how we met and, and just chewing the cud, as they say. Um, and obviously we won't be doing that again, but we, we have had our sort of grumpy old men sort of type of <laughs> hilarious discussions. <laughs> so um, you're, you're happy with this new album? I'm very happy with this new <clears throat> album. And I'll tell you why, because it, you know, it, it provides a choice for people. You know, when I listen, and I listen to everything, you know, and I'm, I'm up with everything that's going on, the young artists and, rap and hip hop and stuff like that. Um, and I think what we have on our two albums is something very different. So, you know, if, if anyone's looking for something different, then tap into um, The Ghost of Santiago because it's a, it's a sort of an album in the old fashioned way. <clears throat> it's not trying to have a hit single or, <clears throat> you know, we've brought it out ourselves on, on my own label. There's no big company behind it. It's just a couple of guys saying, let's do some stuff. And then <clears throat> because of the digital age, I know how to put the stuff out. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Is there a favorite track? <clears throat> well, um, I know Tim's favorite track is Our Love, but uh, I quite like the first one, Space Cannibal, <clears throat> because 
when I did the music to send to Tim, I thought, wow, I've never heard anything like this before, this strange track. And I thought he'll never be able to sing over the top of this. <clears throat> and of course he came back with this track called Space Cannibal, Space Cannibal which is sort of an, you know, an environmental type song really about the sun gobbling up everything, <clears throat> being a space cannibal. And I thought, wow. You know, you couldn't sit down and write a song on a piano like that because it's, I used a lot of sort of electronic beats and things like that to do the backing track. Right. It, <clears throat> it, sounds, it sounds like you liked everything he did and he liked everything you did, like, like the perfect match. Well, it, <clears throat> it was. And I think, you know, we've done these 25 and five more will probably come out next year. Um, and that's probably it. You know, we 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 won't want to push our luck. You know, because it's worked, <clears throat> and we're both happy. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, you know, when you when you know, this is the fiftieth year of me being in a professional musician. And actually, I think I think it probably is for Tim. To tell you the truth, and when you've been in it for a long time, you just want to be happy. You know, you just want to do some good work that you're happy with. <clears throat> And you just like set it off and then if anyone else likes it, that's great. But provided you're happy, you know, it keeps you off the streets. You know. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Talking about 50 years, you're about to head out also with Roxy Music to celebrate their 50th anniversary. That's gone yeah. fast. Um, wow. <laughs> it's what, 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 a, what an incredible run you've had with that band. You started with them in 1972, uh, Phil, didn't you? I did. <clears throat> yes, I I joined literally a week before they signed the first management contract. <clears throat> and um, I, I saw an ad in the Melody Maker. They were looking for a guitarist and I'd heard about <clears throat> them through a demo tape they'd sent to a journalist. And um, I went to meet them. <clears throat> For an audition and um, I knew that they were a little bit older than me but I knew they were very special you know <clears throat> when you walk into this tiny little house in Battersea in, in London <clears throat> and there's Brian Ferry you know and Andy Mackay and Brian Eno and I thought these guys are really cool you know <laughs> I thought I want to be I want to join their band and, but you know I failed the audition did so, you? I failed the audition, but we got on very well as like friends. And they got in a guy who had been in a famous band called The Nice, called Dave List. <clears throat> and that didn't work out. After a couple of months, I got a call and said, would you come try out, really? Um, although they did say, come and try out to mix the sound, not to play guitar. And when <laughs> I turned up, there happened to be a guitar there. And I said, oh, fancy having a, a play. And then, you know, I, so on my 21st birthday, uh, that's the 31st of January, uh, 1972, I was looking at the abyss. I had nothing, no gigs, you know, my friend had joined a professional band. I thought I've got nothing going for me. The next day I had this call to come and, and <clears throat> meet the guys again. The day after that, uh, they asked me to join. The following week, I was playing in a pub in uh, Hammersmith here. Uh, the week after that, we signed the first management contract. Four weeks later, we're in the studio recording the first album. Eight weeks later, it um, the album was released um, on the same day as Siggy Stardust, David Bowie. And, and we were playing, supporting him at a pub in Croydon. Yeah. And then the album was done before. It happened, it was the like Christmas is. every day. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Was your head spinning? Our head was, my head was spinning. <clears throat> but, you know, we, we called ourselves inspired amateurs, you know, and we had to really, like, put our skates on to get more professional, you know. So we did, like, loads and loads of gigs, tiny gigs, loads and loads to, to practice, you know, to practice up. 
and get more professional because we were getting bigger and we were on the TV top of the pops and suddenly the single was number four and everything was happening and we were off, you know, catapulted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had a chat, I think last year I spoke to Andy Mackay about this and of course those guys were pretty much fresh out of art school at the time, weren't they? Nobody was ready for the success. No, I mean, well, Brian... And Andy, to tell you the truth, had been to university. I mean, they had studied, I and mean, Brian had studied fine art with Richard Hamilton, who's the famous British pop artist. <clears throat> and Andy had done music at Reading University. Ina had gone to art college in Winchester, and the same teachers who taught him, of quite revolutionary, were um, taught Pete Townsend. All right. So it's incredible, like connections all over the place. But yeah, we, I mean, when we um, turned up, I, you know, we knew eventually we got to know David Bowie quite well. And, um, you know, he was amazed that we just appeared out of nowhere because he, this was like his fourth album or Ziggy Stardust or something. He'd already He'd paid his dues. Yeah, paid his dues, done hundreds of different kinds of music. <clears throat> and suddenly these buggers turn up fully formed. <laughs> I said, where did they come from? This is ridiculous, you know. And so he loved us and he, he was very nice to us and, and helped us, you know. So what was it like for you? I mean, I can imagine, well, actually, I can't imagine. I'm not sure anybody listening could actually imagine the whirlwind that you, that you were caught in. It must have felt like you were in this tumble dryer with a big smile on your face. It was, I used to say, it was like Christmas every day. I mean, you know, if you grow up with the Beatles, you know, when you're nine or 10 or 11, and then you dream about being in a band, and, and everything you imagine it might be like, <clears throat> to actually get into a band and then get into that band, I was, yeah. It's like I wonder, <laughs> I felt so lucky, you know. And, um, you know, I, I guess it's serendipity that all the, those, that collection of people met at that time and produced something that, that's gone on and here we are. 50 years later, able to go out and do a tour. Yeah, and um, you'll sell it right out too. Amazing. But when you yeah. say that you failed the, when you say that you failed the audition in the first place, what went wrong? Well, I had a terrible cold for a start. <clears throat> I was blowing my nose the whole time. <clears throat> um, they, I think, I played them some of the material of the band I was in before, which was prog rock, you know, <clears throat> very funny time signatures and stuff like that. They hated it. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, oh, well, don't listen to that. I can do simple, you know, but, and, and I guess I was pretty nervous as well. You know, it's a, it, it was the first audition I'd actually ever been to, to do an audition, you know, and auditions are scary things. Anyway, that's right. Yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, I, yeah, so uh, but you also, said I that you, you wrong said that, sorry, you said that you instantly recognized that they had something special, each individual and between them, yeah, yeah, just as people, you know, that they were not like people I'd met before, you know, it was I was only like 18 months out of school or whatever that you know, and um, and they were like five or six years older. So, you know, if you can imagine when you're at school and there's, you're 13 and there's 18 year olds. Yeah. You're they seem all. like, yeah, like, oh, so grown up, you know, they're just, <laughs> just like, you know. <laughs> and they had bank accounts and they had cars and they had things like that, you know, it was like, whoa. <laughs> Obviously over time that age gap narrowed and, yeah. and you didn't feel like that anymore. No. You get on with everybody really well. I mean, the, the synergy between you all is, is really cohesive. Well, it is in a funny way. I mean, we've had ups and downs like any band or any sort of family, really. But I mean, you, you, you know, after a time, you, you forget if you've had an argument with someone about something, then 
the time passes and you forget, why did I have an argument with him? I, I cannot for the life of my, me remember. I think I'm annoyed with him, but I can't remember why. <laughs> so let it go, you know. <clears throat> and then you get back together, you start playing music. And especially these songs bring us together, you know, <clears throat> because we haven't done a tour for 10 years. I mean, I think the last time we toured, we actually came to Australia and, um, and New Zealand. Uh, that was the last time we toured 10 years ago. And um, in America, we haven't toured for 20 years. So mm -hmm. we're going, going, that's why we're going back there. Um, and then when you come and you say, you, you know, we decided we were going to do this. And then we look at the songs and say, wow, that'd be fun to play that. Because I actually haven't played that for 10 years. <laughs> so I've got to relearn how to play it, obviously, you know. You're going to be doing all the old stuff too. Oh, it's, it's all the old stuff. Yeah, there is no new stuff. Yeah, there is no new stuff. So there's eight albums, you see. There's 80 eight songs. Right, 80 songs. Okay. And uh, do you have a favourite amongst those? Well, um, I have a few that, that I enjoy for different reasons. Obviously, for me, songs have a different resonance because I remember where we recorded them, you know, uh, and, um, you know, events that happen during, for instance, there's a tra track called In Every Dream Home A Heart It, <clears throat> which is a, almost like a profane song. <laughs> it's about, you know, an inflatable doll. Uh, this guy has this relationship. And this was on the, the second Roxy album. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when we played it live in theatres in the UK, people would very cheekily buy inflatable doll and then you'd see it coming from the back of the theatre towards the stage being passed over people's heads and you know it's meant to be sort of tense sort of song and you just couldn't help but just like starting to laugh this thing was coming towards you and then when it explodes at the end the, into a big guitar so it's like it was a lot of fun you know so you know I'm hoping that we can recapture some of the fun element of Roxy because you can, as it goes on, it, you know, the bands, they become a little bit more serious. Yes. And, uh, you know, it becomes like, you become too professional really, you know, well, so. Roxy Music always struck me as a group of guys who did take themselves very seriously, themselves yeah. and the music, right? Well, yeah, and, and uh, you know, how wrong could you be, really? I mean, it's a lot of fun and laughter in doing the Roxy stuff. But I guess, you know, Brian's image was pretty cool and sort of suave and all that kind of thing. So I guess that's where that comes from. <clears throat> but, you know, it's quite a few jokers. Amongst <laughs> you. Well, it, it wasn't Brian. He always appeared to be very aloof and standoffish and, and very serious in what he did. And, and, and so you, you couldn't touch him. You couldn't get near him. He just, he was like, yeah. put himself Give on the mountaintop. A, true. Give him a few drinks and the Geordie in him comes out, you know, from Northeast. He comes very funny and quite lively. <laughs> ah, good to know. Why hasn't there been anything new from Roxy in a, in a long time? Well, because, well, actually, I mean, we did try and do something. I think in, <clears throat> it could have been 2005. I really had have to look <clears throat> my computer and see it. <clears throat> we went in the studio with Eno and with uh, Chris Thomas, our original producer. <clears throat> and we laid down some tracks and we started working on them. And then, and then we just lost the, um, the sort of spark, you know, and we thought it doesn't really sound better than some of the stuff we did before. So <clears throat> perhaps we'll just abandon it. And we did. Right. Much to the uh, disappointment of the record company. <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> but I, I think it's a it, it, it's a, a good thing to know when to give it away, isn't it? I mean, it, it's yeah, like and I putting think, the pushing the proverbial uphill if you're not if it's not flowing. Well, yes, I, and I think there's a certain element of like lots of people would say, "Oh, why don't you do a new album or something like that?" 
And then if it wasn't very good, they say, oh, that was awful. Why did you do that? Yeah. You know, we are quite expendable to people if, unless you come up with the goods and fair enough, you know, there, there's, it's, you know, if historically, if you look at pop music and rock music, it's quite rare for people to do really good work um, that compares with their early work. But there are some exceptions. I mean, you know, I love the last Bruce Springsteen album, actually. And, and you know, um, and Dylan. Yeah, you know, he's just gotten up. better and better. Yeah. Yeah, just some great things. And But I think to work together as a band, I, I'm not sure if there's a lot of left in terms of recording new stuff. I mean, we, you know, I have played on some of Ryan's new stuff. Um, where I don't know whether it'll end up or he'll rub it out. I'd normally say to him, look, I'll play whatever you want. If you don't like it, just rub it out. I don't, really don't care. You know? <laughs> and normally he does rub it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, um, it would, we just all into music. I mean, every, you know, whether it's Eno, Brian Ferry, Andy Mackay, Paul Thompson, they're all doing music. This whole, these whole 50 years and different kinds of music with different people, just enjoying being in music. Yeah, you know? well, you've done, I mean, you've spent a lot of time doing your own solo stuff. And then of course you've worked with Split Ends a lot too. You produced their stuff, didn't you? Well, I, I, I produced the, the, what over here was their first album in England, but it was actually called Second Thoughts in Australia. And, in, and, and then I did a, a, um, a single, called Another Great Divide, I think. But then, you know, Neil and, um, well, Tim and Neil and even Eddie played on my solo album, K-Scope, and then Tim has played on other, sang on some of my other solo albums as well. So we have continued um, doing bits and pieces, you know, whenever we happen to be in the same place or it suited, you know. How does the skill of being a great musician translate into becoming a great producer? <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily. Uh, production is a bit like being, uh, there's a little psychology in <clears throat> production. I mean, if I was to, there's different kinds of producers as well. There's engineers who become producers. There's lots of those or there's the George Martin School of Production. And that's the kind of thing that I aspire to, which is a person who can stand back, think conceptually, not twiddle the, all the knobs and the dials, <clears throat> know what it all does, but be able to say, what would happen if we did that? Or what's this song about? You know, yeah, why, yeah. you know, let's get to the core of, you know, it's a more sort of artistic side. <clears throat> and then be someone there to just say, well, that's great, but you could do it this other way if you wanted to try it. You know, and that's my kind of style. It's not like Phil Spector say, like, we're going to do it. Yeah. <coughs> have this yeah. sound and do no, it. I can, I can imagine you'd be really affable to work with and, and, and it'd just go back and forward between whoever you were working with. I imagine that the, the Finn brothers must have been really pleased to have you on board and, and what they put out re really set them on their way, didn't it? <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they have just an incredible talent. I mean, just, it must be in their DNA. Uh, I'm sure it's their Irish genes. <laughs> Or something. I mean, you know, there've been certain special people that I've worked with, like Godley and Cream, over the years, who are fantastic songwriters and just just can do magic. And the Finn Brothers are the same. And uh, you know, uh, uh, and other people are more complicated, you know, but talented in a different way. So, for instance, when I I produced David Gilmore and and help produce a Pink Floyd album. That's a totally different kind of thing, you know, when you've got a good, great guitarist, and I'm a guitarist, you know, and, and also a friend, and you, you know, and someone with a beautiful voice like David, you know, and um, you've got to, you know, just be another ear. 
yeah. for him to, you know, he, he could do it all himself if he wanted to, but it's boring and he needs someone to bounce his ideas off, you know, what who was it he like? can trust. What was it like working with him? It was great, actually. It was great because that's a whole different world, you know, the sort of Pink Floyd world and touring with him. It's like money's no object. You know, you can have the best equipment in the whole. <laughs> he has a studio on a boat, you know, on a 1920s boat that belonged to Charlie Chaplin's manager, parked by Hampton Court Palace, <clears throat> you know, in, on the River Thames. And I mean, it's just, I just sit at the back of the boat and look out where the control room was and look at like kingfishers flying along, you know, and swans going past. <laughs> it, and then there's this incredible guitar coming out of the speakers, you know. So it was just, again, it, it was just like a dream, you know, I just, you know, because I met him when I was 16. He was a friend of my brother's to ask him how to become a professional musician. <laughs> and he, he says he can't remember what he said, but it must have been good because five years later I got into rock. <laughs> must have been great advice. Oh, yeah. I wish you could remember it. We could pass yeah. it on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So you, you must be looking forward to this tour. Well, actually, before I just go there and, and Zoom's going to kick us off in, in six minutes and 42, yeah. but um, you, you, Phil, you're a man of all shades of music, aren't you? It, your, your own solo stuff is very different to the Roxy stuff. The Roxy stuff is very different to, to the, the split ends and crowded house stuff. And of course, that is so different to the Pink Floyd stuff as well. What's, is, it, is it that you just like everything? I don't like everything, but I do have a, a, a very large musical palette to draw on, 